Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started because I know everybody's time is incredibly valuable. And uh, so today we're going to talk about creating meaningful connections in an online course. I'm going to click on the right spots here. Um, so uh, I've got about four things that we want to try and cover today, and it's, you know, why is it important to create those meaningful connections um, with and among the students in an online course? What types of tools are available to use um, to create meaningful connections in um, a Hiram College online course? Activi uh, what types of activities are appropriate to generate meaningful conversations or connections between students and faculty? Um, and where do I begin and what are some innovative ways to try to connect with students in an online course? So, why is it important to create meaningful connections with and among the student, uh, students in an online course? Let me make sure I'm doing it. Um, so I just really like this picture and wanted to include it. It's really pretty. So that, that was the whole purpose for this slide was to use this photo because it's so beautiful. So uh, let's see here. Okay. So the importance. Um, so, you know, we want our students to have the best experience possible, be that face-to-face -face or be that online. We want to make that connection with them. We want them to have a good experience with Hiram in general, but we also want them to walk away with, um, you know, feeling like they got something from the course. And without meaningful interaction um, with either their instructor or their classmates, they're going to feel disoriented and disconnected, and then they're just going to lose interest in the course, and at that point you've lost them. We want to try and prevent that from happening. So, you know, by making personal connections between you and the students, but also between the students, students themselves, um, that will increase their level of engagement and, um, in turn, Gets, uh, raises their uh, achievement and retention rates. And then, again, students want to feel that the instructor is there with them, right? They don't want to feel like they're just teaching themselves the content. Uh, they they want to know that um, somebody's there and actually walking them through what's happening. Um, so there's like three different types of interaction in, a, in an online course typically that we think about. Um, this is from Quality Matters in terms of um, how they approach it. And uh, so there's learner content interaction, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But that's basically, you know, interacting with textbooks, videos, um, articles, excuse me, anything that you've got that's content um, more so than something that they're maybe as actively engaging with. Um, learner learner is between the students themselves. So how are they, how are we engaging them with each other? You know, because yeah, it's an online course and they kind of want to be disconnected in some ways, but it's still important for them to know how to interact in an online space as well. And then learner instructor. So a lot of times this can be, you know, your assignments, that kind of stuff that you're giving them that feedback on. So they're getting interaction with you on some level and know that you're there um, to assist them and to provide that guidance. And again, they're not just taking multiple choice quizzes all the time and never hearing from an instructor. You know, the, at that point, what's, what's the point? Um, then it's just doing the same thing over and over. Um, so then I wanted to pull out kind of the most common Moodle to tools for each of these kinds of interactions uh, that, we use, that a lot of people use. Um, so one in Moodle is the discussion forum. That is probably the most popular option available to utilize. Um, when I've taught online courses, I use it almost weekly uh, a lot of times because I uh, there's always something we can be talking about, be it, um, you know, something with the course or maybe uh, the one I'm about to teach for the power of neurodiversity. You know, some of it's even just getting them to think about themselves and how they think and how they um, interact with the world. And I'm kind of curious to see how they're going to, to respond to some of those prompts that are like that um, to kind of Make them not just, you know, understand things about ADHD or other things, but also understand about themselves, too, and hearing what their peers are saying about themselves. Um, the other common tool, but it, it's not as common, um, but it's the closest probably second runner-up for learner-learner interaction, and that's the workshop feature. And so the workshop feature is really good for um, if they have to write papers or if they need to provide like peer comments back on something. So it may not just be papers, it could be if they created a video or something or 
um, they created something, then um, you could use the workshop feature to um, to have them peer review with each other. And that's helpful in a lot of ways too. The only downside of the workshop feature is it's a little funky um, and it does take a little tweaking and figuring out how best to use it. Uh, it can be a little um, finicky um, in Moodle. I've been asking them to try and fix that so that it's easier and more intuitive to use. But once you start using it and you get you figure out some of the kinks with it. You're, uh, it's a, it's a pretty good tool once you're, once you're at that point. I think last session, um, Lacey had mentioned that she uses it a lot and really enjoys um, getting to, to access that. So uh, she says she gets a lot of value out of using the workshop feature. And she did agree also that it is a little finicky at times. Um, and then for learner, learner, or excuse me, learner instructor interaction, the most common Moodle tools themselves are um, the assignment feature. So they submit their assignment, you go in and you grade it, right? It's it's really straightforward, it, but you give them feedback, right? It's not just an exam or a quiz where, maybe, again, maybe it's multiple choice or true false. It's again a place where you can provide them your personal feedback. Um, ways for them to improve something, ways for them to rethink something. Um, and that, again, is invaluable. Quizzes are great because they kind of give you a baseline of where they're sitting and, you know, things like that. But in terms of, like, really getting, feeling like they're getting feedback from an instructor, the assignment, uh, the assignment feature is really helpful. And then the discussion forum feature is also very helpful um, for, you know, learner-instructor interaction because while I don't comment on every single student's post necessarily, I always do in the intro, in the introductory form I do, I always try to comment on every single person's intro. But after that, I don't comment on everybody's, but I comment on some key things that I see um, and tell people to kind of look through them each time um, that I make comments in there. So when I, when I send a weekly announcement or something, I tell them, hey, I went in and you know commented, make sure you go in and see what you know, what we, what we said in, in the discussion form, so they can kind of go back and look at it. Um, but that way they know, they know, again, you're present and you're paying attention to what they're doing. You're not just saying, oh, it's an online course, so they never need to even know I exist. They, again, it's, it's knowing that you're there on some level. Um, and then some other tools that can help promote making connections on uh, Moodle. So we've got, uh, for Learner Learner, there's the chat feature. So it I means so it's just like what it sounds like. It's a chat feature. They can chat with each other in groups or whatever you want, you know, however you want to set it up. Uh, there's a database, and this is where they can kind of collabor collaboratively pull together things like um, the database is good for you know, if you're in an art course and you're showing a bunch of images and you want them to create a database of images related to that. Um, so you know, maybe you're looking at the neoclassical era or something, and you tell them they have to go out and find um, pieces that represent this. And then they can, you know, they all compile them into this database and can pull them out um, and look at each other's and see what they're saying, you know, see what's there. And they can also put in descriptions and information that way. Uh, so that's actually really um, an interesting tool. And then I, the other one that I really like, uh, I haven't used it yet, but I really, thinking I might hear soon, um, is the debate tool. So this one's a relatively new feature, and you can have um, you know, either groups of students or students one-on-one -on -one debate with each other, right? Give them a topic, give one of them the pros, one of them's the cons. Then they have to debate, you know, two sides of that coin. Another way for them to interact with each other, but this way they're not necessarily doing it in a in you know face-to-face where that can be a little more intimidating. This one can be, you know, you've got time to think about your answers to respond, which, you know, some students really appreciate just having that extra moment to breathe and think before they're, you know, in that middle of the debate uh, situation. Um, the forums we've talk, talked about, because those are the discussion forums. Uh, the glossary is another great tool for learner-learner interaction. Um, I'm about to use it and see how this goes in um, my second eight week uh, course here. And uh, so they can, again, sort of like the database, create definitions. Um, I'm going to have them, because it's the power of neurodiversity, I'm going to have, um, I have eight groups, and they're each going to, uh, they each have been assigned a, um, 
neurodiverse topics. So uh, one of the first group is what's neurodiversity. So they have to, um, but they have to write it all in my particular class. They have to write it all in positive language. So not focusing on the deficits of any of these things, but focusing on the positives because it's the power of neuro neurodiversity. And so I'm really curious to see what they create in this glossary because they each have to, each group has to do two entries and one's, you know, the name of whatever, like ADHD or autism. And then the other one that they also have to do is benefits of that. So they have to do a positive like definition and they have to give um, another like separate set of like benefits to having um, this disorder. And then what I'm going to do at the end is take all of that information and in week eight, they're going to have a short quiz that's open notes, um, but where they can go in, I'm going to pull out information from this glossary and um, have those be parts of the questions. So they have to kind of go back and make sure that they go in and look at, um, you know, what their peers did and what they, how they were approaching it. So I think that that's, um, I think it's going to be an interesting um, endeavor. I'm going to be curious to see how it ends up happening. Um, so I'll keep, I'll keep you guys posted on that one. Uh, and then another great learner learner tool is the wiki. You know, sort of like it sounds, it's like a, a Wikipedia with, you know, sort of like an online website kind of situation. The nice thing about it with Moodle is that it stays in Moodle. So it's not open to the public. It's not sitting out there with, you know, could potentially be found. It's staying within Moodle. So students can feel maybe a little more comfortable in, you know, collaborating in that if they know that it's only staying within that course. Um, and then we talked about the workshop feature for learner-learner interaction. Learner-instructor interaction, um, we talked about the assignment feature. Uh, and then the chat feature, same thing. You can utilize the chat as the instructor with them. We've talked about the forum. We've talked about the glossary uh, and the wiki and the workshop. So those ones we've all covered. And again, those are just ways for you to also interact with them. And then there's also the survey tool that can be helpful. So the survey tool, um, you can... Uh, if you want to kind of get an idea or a baseline of something with them, see where they're at. You know, maybe it's week three and you're you're not sure they're quite getting some piece of it. You can kind of, you can do the survey tool, you know, create a question or two, and then have them complete that. And then you can check in on that and say, okay, I see where there's confusion. So it kind of gives you that opportunity to kind of take in where the class is at at that moment. Because again, being in an online course, it's not as easy to ask questions when you're, you know, in that moment, you're not seeing your instructor. It's not like you can raise your hand and ask the question as easily as you can in a face-to-face -face course. So it, uh, the survey tool can kind of give you that, that baseline to check in every now and again with them. If you know. So then um, other tools that are outside Moodle that could promote learner-learner interaction, and these are pretty much free or mostly free um, or have some variation of free access uh, to hiring faculty. Um, Nearpod, I talked about that one at the last one. Uh, Nearpod is a great resource. It's got the, it's got discussion boards. It's got different ways that they could interact with each other within it. Um, another one that I like that I've seen um, and been seeing more recently is VoiceThread. And that's an opportunity where students can, you know, present a slide or they could present a PowerPoint or um, they can present a video and it, it's got the video, it's got the recording there. They could just respond um, using audio. So they could just say their, their responses to somebody if they wanted to say, oh, I really liked how you did this. They can just respond that way. It's sort of like they're in an in-person class, but it's within this environment online. And people can go back in and go, oh, they responded to this. Oh, that's interesting. And respond back if they wanted to. And, and there's still also the, the option of typing out an answer um, within it. And it's a it's an interesting tool. Um, I've used it in some courses that I've taken, and um, each time I use it, it seems like they've added better features for it, so it's getting better. Uh, Slack is, uh, you know, a collaboration tool, and um, so Slack. Hold on, I'm just moving my notes because I'm. I put them in the wrong spot over here because uh, there's so many of these that I forget which ones are which. So Slack, uh, again, teamwork and collaboration tool, uh, great to use if you want them to be working in groups. Um, Microsoft Teams is, again, another one, and this one is uh, completely free to us. It's built into our, and they all have access to it. It's built into our Office 365. 
And this is where they can share files, they can chat with each other, and it's all in one location for a group. And so, you know, it's kind of capturing everything that's happening. They can upload documents, they can um, have that chat feature, they can use it similar to Zoom, so they can use um, Microsoft Teams video um, aspect. So it, it's got a lot of great functionality, especially if you want teamwork to be happening. Um, Perusal is another good one, especially for those in the, the writing and humanities section. Um, it's an e-reader platform that allows students to, um, and faculty to annotate assigned readings. So, you know, they can go in and annotate and then they can see what their peers have said. You know, if they're annotating too, or the faculty are annotating, they can see all of that um, happen and can keep going in and seeing. So it's, it's another great way to um, interact. Uh, Flipgrid is another one, and it's a website that allows uh, others to create grids and facilitate video uh, discussions. So each grid is sort of like a message board, um, and teachers can post questions in that, and then students can post their video responses as well. A word wall we've seen, you know, probably in, in some other situations where, you know, it just starts to pull all of the, the words that people are using in the discussion post or wherever, in into like one big word cloud so you can see what is exactly happening right like everybody is mentioning this word you know it's it's real so that must be something we need to focus in on because it's important um so things like that it's you know it, it's interactive it can be um you can print print it off so it's also got print printable capabilities and it can be on any you know web enabled device which is also nice um, it works fairly well on the on the ipad from what i understand as well and then Explain Everything is another one that we pay for at Hiram that all students and faculty and staff have access to. And this is, a, you know, kind of like a presentation whiteboard app. So if you're teaching math, for example, and you want them to be able to show you the process that they walk through to complete a problem, because you want to see, you know, something's wrong, and you want to see where it went wrong with them, they could use Explain Everything to create the presentation, right? They could They could use that and say, here I'm, you know, adding the two and the two. I'm really clearly not a math person, but uh, and here's how I'm getting four. I put these blocks together, and suddenly there's four, something like that. So they can, um, you know, walk through that process as they go through it. Um, so again, if you like, if you're needing to worry about processes, that's a good one to kind of allow them to show you what they're doing. But that also they can share that with each other and see how, oh, you know you were saying this about this topic, here's what I, you know, here's how I interpret it over here, but I see what you're saying there. So like there's ways you can utilize those. So maybe you put them in a discussion forum or um, you reach out to each other uh, via um, chat or something. Those are, those are options there. I would probably say with this one, um, the only downside is it does create larger video sizes. So um, what I would say is once they've done that recording, um, upload it into YouTube unlisted, uh, like they do with some of their other, like if any other video projects we've been having them do, because then it um, file size won't matter and they can just provide the link to share with each other in the discussion forum. Um, one extra step, but that way they're not frustrated when they're not able to upload it because it's more than 50 megabytes, because that's all Google will let us do, or Google, yeah. Um, Moodle will let us do that. A lot of oohs. So, um, so then um, on the you know learner instructor side for interaction, again free or free access for hiring faculty. A lot of the same ones, right? Nearpod, VoiceThread, Slack, Microsoft Teams, Perusal, um, Flipgrid, Wall, Wordwall, and Explain Everything. But there's a couple extra ones in here. Um, Loom is a good one if you want to record your lectures. Um, it, it helps you to um, um, narrate and uh, you can put in like pauses in, in videos and have it ask a question. So that's always nice. So they have to kind of stop, answer the question, and then, you know, see if they're retaining the information that they're watching, which is helpful. So if you're giving a lecture, you want to stop them after, you know, you finish this section. Um, of like two minutes, have them answer a question related to that and go from there. Um, markup here is similar to um, Perusal where they can, it's sort of like an annotation tool. Um, they can 
um, you can annotate, and it's more on your side a little bit more to annotate back to them than it may be for them to interact with you. Um, and then YouTube, again, just because that's where you can upload your, your videos and, um, you know, interact with them that way. Um, you know, in terms of creating content for your course, right? Yeah, you can use outside videos, and I tend to use outside videos quite a bit. But what I like to try to do is each week at least do an intro video of the things that we're going to talk about and highlight. And I'll show you an example of this and what I what I've put together so far um, in that theater course we've been kind of building um, throughout this term or this year. So uh, I'll show you that um, after we finish going through this. But it it at least again continues to give that personal touch. And even if you don't do one every week, if you do. Um, at least an introduction one of yourself. It gives, you know, you can write out your introduction and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. But even just seeing you behind the camera a little bit, you know, at least once, makes you a person to them. And again, they don't feel like they're just talking to a wall and nobody's paying attention to what they're writing anyway, so why does it matter? Yeah. So, okay, so now you, you know, you know, you've got some ideas of things you can do. So, okay, so how do you begin? Um, and so I always kind of start with um, an online course uh, introductory video about myself. That's the first thing I do is I create a special introductory video for each time I teach a course because I want, you know, things have changed with me or things have changed, um, you know, it's depending on the content of the course. But this way, um, you know, they get to know you a little bit. And I always try to put something personal in there. Like, I mean, it doesn't have to be crazy personal, but something, you know, where it's, it's engaging and I'm not just saying, yes, and here's my expertise and this is exactly this and, you know, sounding like the, the high flute, maybe Harvard grad uh, instructors or whatever. Um, it, it makes you person again, right? Like give a little bit about yourself, just like you would in your in-person class. Um, another option, create a discussion forum. Um, or other mechanisms so that the students can introduce themselves to each other. So um, in the class I'm about to teach, I have them asking, uh, they have to answer the discussion form and, and in intro one where they have to say their name, their major, their preferred pronouns, their preferred name, their preferred pronouns, their major, their class year, uh, why they're interested in the course, but then they also have to um, tell me their favorite ice cream flavor and why. Um, I always try to give it something different so that I'm learning something new about people each time. So sometimes it's ice cream, sometimes it's cookies, sometimes it's, you know, I apparently really like sweets because I tend to go to that first. But it's kind of a great icebreaker, sort of like what you would have if you were sitting there um, in class, the first day of class, and you wanted to get to know everybody. You know, you'd go around and have everybody introduce themselves. So this would be the way to capture that, I think. Um, and... Again, I normally tell them they have to respond to at least one person in this one, just to, again, make sure that they're actually reading each other's a little bit. Um, and that way, again, they're, they're making that interaction. So, you know, like I said before, it sounds familiar, right? It's similar to what you do on your first day of class in person. So it doesn't have to be crazy different. Um, it's just in a written format, perhaps, um, than it is in a, in a, you know, when we're all together face to face. So that's helpful. Um, and then innovative ways to connect with students in an online class. So, you know, we talked a little bit about VoiceThread. You can have, you know, you can use VoiceThread for all of your class discussions and they could be responding to each other. Um, and they have to do it, you know, one of two ways. They could do it video or they could do it audio. And, but they have to respond. So then you're, again, hearing voices. It makes it more um, personalized in some ways. Um, and you know, again, it allows for presentations, audio and video. So if you have a final presentation or something, this could be a great way for them to show that and then their peers can respond and give them feedback, just like we try to do in our in-person classes a lot of times. And again, they could also um, respond by typing a response in VoiceThread. So if uh, I normally try to push them at least on one of those where they have to do at least two different mediums if, we're gonna, if I'm gonna go that way, just for them to get that practice. But I don't push it too far where if, you only want to do one video response throughout the whole thing to, to appear, that's fine. But you still have to do at least one video and one 
typed response or one video and one audio response. Just again to keep them not always doing the same thing. Um, holding virtual office hours, right? Tell them that you'll have your Zoom room open from this time to this time. Yeah, you know, Mondays at 7 to 10 p.m., whatever. And, you know, just have it open. I mean, frequently when I've done that, they don't come to them most of the time. So I typically try to keep them like till two hours or less that I've got it open because otherwise it's just hanging out there. But again, knowing that you're available to them is helpful. Just try and keep it somewhat consistent so that they know each week on Tuesdays at two, you're going to be around that I could jump in there if I needed to. And the only other thing I would say with that is if you're going to do that, probably a good, uh, since it's an online course, probably a good idea to hold it in um, either a weekend or an evening time, mostly because, um, you know, some of our students are going to be working during regular business hours. So just think about who, who your students might be in an online course if you're doing that. Uh, we talked about the chat feature. Utilize that. Let them talk to each other. And again, you we've got the rules of netiquette in our syllabus so they can um, know what's appropriate. You can always call them out when it's not appropriate behavior. Um, and then, you know, again, create fun instructor-created videos to help the students learn the content. You know, I'm, I've tried to, in my videos, not be so boring where I'm literally just like, and today we're going to talk about Roman theater, and this is what it is. I try to throw in, like, fun tidbits about something to make it engaging. Um, I put a little gem in my syllabus. I'm waiting to see if I'll find out if anybody notices this semester, where they have, if they can get some extra credit if they send me a fun meme, something that makes them laugh. Email that to me, and then they'll get some extra credit out of it. Again, just trying to keep them engaged, have fun with it. Um, again, I don't know if they'll notice it in the syllabus, but I'm, I'm kind of hoping they do because I'd love to see some funny things. And then, um, you know, create weekly check-ins where, uh, you know, you can have that, that uh, kind of muddiest points forum at the start of your thing where that's where they can ask any questions. The only thing I have found with using something like that is make sure that you're subscribed to that forum so that you're going to get an email because I have frequently found that I forget to subscribe. And then for whatever reason, I forget and lose the fact that that forum is up at the start of my class. And so they'll have asked a question and I miss it. So um, I found that if I, when I set it up, if I automatically subscribe myself, then I know I'll get their, their, uh, their questions and I can respond back to them in actually a timely manner. Because I had at least one time where it was like two weeks later and I was like, I'm so sorry, I totally, miss this forum in my thing. Um, and, you know, again, have them work in groups. I know it's an online course, but they can coordinate. They can figure out a way to meet, um, you know, once or twice. It doesn't have to be a huge group project. But they can work in groups online. They can coordinate through Teams. They can coordinate through Zoom. They can coordinate. We have so many tools now that they can communicate. And at this point in the pandemic, they're probably incredibly used to figuring out ways to make this happen. So utilize that. Um, you know, in the course that I team teach with Amber, that I'm going to be team teaching with Nick this summer on autism, um, they have to um, work in groups to create a scene or um, a small script, a 10 minute little vignette. And they have, you know, that's their, their final class project. So they have to go through and meet with each other at a couple different points to make sure that they're staying on track to complete that by the time week eight rolls around. So um, just another good kind of option. Um, again, collaboration, connections, that's what we're trying to accomplish um, when we're trying to do this. Okay, quickly, this is the next, um, what's it called? Uh, workshop that'll be happening on March 16th, so making your course accessible for all. This is going to be a particular favorite of mine right here. So um, plan to come to that, but let me hop over now to, um, what is this? Uh, let me pop over here to the uh, top of the theater course. Give me a moment. Should have had that pulled up, but or no, 150. 
So this is what I've been working on building. And so, um, you know, hasn't changed drastically since our last um, couple iterations here. So got the syllabus, all of that stuff. But if I scroll down a little bit and I get past this, the course description, um, we get to the introductions. And here you see I popped in a video of me introducing myself. And um, I don't know if it'll play very well if I zoom, so I'm just going to... I use the same music for everything. My name is Brittany Jackson, and I will be your instructor for this course. I have sat where you're sitting as I earned my degrees in theater and communication from Hiram College in 2004. And in 2015, I completed my master's in interdisciplinary studies, again from Hiram College. I just recently completed my doctorate in educational leadership studies from Ashton University. If Hiram had had a doctoral program, I probably would have pursued that here as well, regardless of the discipline. My day job is as Hiram's online learning manager, meaning I oversee Moodle and help faculty design their online courses. If you ever have questions about Moodle, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. I have acted in and directed several productions during my time as a student, but also during my 13 plus years here as a staff member. You will note that each week there is an introductory video about what we will cover and what you should pay special attention to. In this course, I hope to provide you with an understanding and appreciation of the theater world. If you run into any issues or have any questions regarding assignments or other items related to this course, do not hesitate to reach out to me. I can't know if you're struggling or confused if you don't tell me. Open communication is key in my classes. If you let me know you're struggling or will miss a deadline for any reason, please reach out to me ahead of the deadline if at all possible. The more proactive you are in your commu communication, the more I'm willing to work with you. Now, as we say in the theater, take your places and let the show begin. So you know, making it a little bit more engaging, you know, trying to connect with them. And then I've added in, you know, some videos each week. So in this, in these videos, I've been, I tried to include little theater tidbits um, to kind of keep them somewhat engaged. So this I need to fix the beginning of songs because that's what really need Martha Graham once said, theater is a verb before it is a noun, an act before it is a place. Welcome to the first week of our course. Be sure to review the syllabus located in the getting started section of this course. This will provide you with all the deadlines and course policies. It's your responsibility to read the syllabus in its entirety. You never know, there may be hidden gems in there for you. As theater is an art form, we will be exploring opportunities for you not only to explain your understanding, but also to show your understanding in creative ways. I always like to share little tidbits about theater as we go along. This week's tidbit. Did you know that Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in London is the only building allowed to have a thatched roof since the Great Fire in 1666? I visited the Globe a few years ago and I'm still all shocked by its simple power. So, week one, we will be discussing what theatre is, what it's capable of, if it still has relevancy in today's... I'm like, so you can kind of see what, you know, it's introducing the information, getting them um, engaged, not just being like, okay, all work, no play. Again, you know, bring yourself into it. Uh, they're going to want to, um, again, know that you're there. And so what I did, if I scroll through this course, is you'll see that each week, you know, I've got all the description of what they need to do. But then there's that video of me also explaining that a little bit more. And then there were assignments and everything, learning objectives again. And here... Um, I need to fix how that one's in there, but, you know, another video. And I've done that each, um, for each week that we're meeting. So, and again, in each one of those, I try to find a different um, fun theater fact to, to toss in there to keep them engaged um, in that one. So, you know. How long do you usually make each of your little videos? Um, anywhere from, like, two to, I don't try to go more than five minutes. Um, maybe the week one might go a little bit longer than five um if it if we really i uh, really want to set certain things up for them to understand um but most of the time i keep them pretty brief and just go over okay here are the things i want you to pay attention to and notice here's what we need to do this week here's a fun fact and then um you know go to go to the next fun thing so um again you know the more you 
connect with them and the more they see you, right, the more they're going to feel engaged and feel like you're a part of that course and that they're a part of that course and it's not just, again, them teaching themselves how to do it, how to do something. Because that's incredibly, probably the hardest part about an online course is how do you make them feel connected? And it's been shown that things like this, just these simple things that I did all of these, like I wrote out all the scripts for these videos to kind of make sure I was capturing everything I wanted to tell them each week. And then I went ahead and recorded all of them because they're short. Uh, I think the whole process of recording the eight videos and editing them total took me maybe like two-ish hours, two and a half hours total by the time all was said and done. Mostly because I was able to read a script a little bit easier, so I, there weren't as many ums and uhs, so I didn't have to cut those out as much. But um, it didn't take me too long to create a five-minute video, right? It, it takes five minutes, and if you want to just make sure you've cut off the ends of, um, and do it that way, that's totally fine. So, you know, the process gets, once you've done it once or twice, it, it becomes really quick um, and easy to, to create. Um, because again, you can utilize maybe some information you've used before in other things and um, go from there. So. Well, Brittany, Brittany, I've made some videos and um, well, I performed in them. I didn't make the video. What I did in my quilting for social justice class was because I now have nine sewing machines and um, I have about four or five different styles of machines and they all get threaded differently. So I went through and I numbered everything. So every machine has a number and a book that corresponds it to the foot is numbered. So you know what goes with what. And then I made some videos. And how we did this was that one of my students for extra credit for one of her community service projects for the class, she videoed me teaching every machine on her phone. These videos are rather longish. They're probably 10 minutes each. And there's five of them. And then we got closed down. Because of okay. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to put them on Moodle. And so we got closed down and everybody had to go home. So nobody needed my videos anymore. But they're done and they're ready. And, and I prepared them and had a good background. And they were all set up in Gerstocker. So I want these saved. And she said we, she didn't know how to get them from her phone onto Moodle or from her phone onto YouTube. And so she still has them saved for me, but I'll be teaching this class again and it'll also work for my work study students. So I'd like to have them someplace, maybe not just on my Moodle website for um, quilting for social justice because other classes might want to know how to um, thread these machines because I'm going to do a POPs class too. The POPs class would like to know. So how do I get them from my student's phone to a usable format? So if she's uh, got a an iPhone, like if it, if it was an Apple product, you could AirPlay. Um, so she could AirPlay, or AirPlay, yeah. No, AirPlay's doing it. AirDrop, I'm like, it's one of the airs. AirDrop it um, to your iPad. Um, since I'm like, since I know you've got an iPad. I she, do. She could, if it's an iPhone, she could airdrop it over to your um, iPad, and then you'd have access to them there where you could um, use them and upload them to Moodle, so, or, or upload them to YouTube, I mean. So I would put them to YouTube first and then put them into Moodle? Yeah, I would use, yeah, I would put them in YouTube first. Um, because Each one is a separate video, so sewing machine number one and two video. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, so because they're especially because they're ten minutes long, they're gonna surpass that limit that Moodle has set in there for five. Yeah, they're pretty they're pretty long because I had to show how to do the top threading, the bottom threading, and then a few other tools like how to use it. Right. Yeah, so I would I would uh if if it's an iPhone have her airdrop. If it's not, um she could save them to um, if she connected her OneDrive on her phone, she could save them to OneDrive and, and put them all in a folder and then share that folder with you. And then you could download them from there and, you know, do the same thing. Um, upload them to YouTube and go from there. Um, 
because again, even if she tried to email, you put them into OneDrive and email them to me, or it, they're probably going to be too big for email, more than likely. So how would she get them to me? Uh, if she if she put them if she uploaded them into her OneDrive account and then mm -hmm. shared the folder that she creates with them in. Oh, it, okay, yeah, okay. Then you then you'd have access to the videos that way. Got it. And if you know if she want if you wanted to send her over to um, like if she if it's not an iPhone and you want to send her over here and we can walk her through how she could do that piece of it like get it to OneDrive we're more than welcome to right maybe I will yeah because we yeah we'll definitely help so she's an honors student so she had to do a community service project for the class and she picked that and it was a great service mm -hmm. the students would have been very happy because and so would I because I'm really tired of people going Betsy this is unthreaded. I need help. My machine's not sewing. It's not working. So, I've been seeing the pictures. That was a that was really uh really cool. I liked it. They did a good job. But they would have done better if we'd been together, you know, they were trying to do it at home and they didn't have sewing machines. Yeah. I when I heard that we'd gone we were going remote, I immediately thought of your class going, I know that they're sewing using machines. Yeah. I don't think many people have one anymore. I, I have no. one. You actually need and to I had me. 17 students, which have made me so happy. Yeah, I, need, I need to bring mine to you because I actually still have it in my closet. I haven't brought it over yet. So, and I'm like, and I don't use it. So I need to get it to you so it gets in use. Thank you, Brittany, for your uh, expertise and for your help, as always. Thank you for the workshop. You're welcome. And uh, other questions? Um, no, I have lots of notes. I know that you recorded it, but I I can listen better if I take notes. Understandable. I do the same thing. Uh, Jan, uh, any questions uh, from Jan or Charles? No, it was helpful. Thanks so much, Brittany. You're welcome. Um, if you guys think of things, you know, again, this will be put in both the uh, Teaching with Technology resource site and in the um, online boot camp site that I'll be sending out once we finish the next, um, um, what's it called? The next workshop in March. So I'm finishing kind of pulling together. I'm, I'm utilizing these videos, but I'm also like creating little lessons and that kind of stuff that you can utilize in the, um, in the online workshop to, you know, remind yourself how to do something or things to think about when you're creating it. Cause I think what we're, we may start doing, um, Jeff and I talked a little bit about it, is if we want people to teach online, um, you know, and they haven't taught online before, we kind of like them to maybe go through something like this that is, wouldn't take too long, but it gives them all those basic tools to get them started. Thank you. You're welcome. And if you guys think of questions, come find me. You know how to find me. Hey, thanks a lot, Brittany. You're welcome. Bye, Charles. Bye-bye now.